Welcome to the Rounds to Residency podcast, brought to you by Med School Coach. Each episode, get clinical rotation advice and tips to prepare for your externships and residency in healthcare. We interview preceptors and physician educators who will prepare you for your rotation and improve your clinical experience. Now, here's your host, Chase DeMarco. Jeremy Toffel is a pediatrician in the Nebraska area and runs the Imperfect Dad MD blog. Through this material, he helps to bring his parenting and medical experiences together to let parents know that they are not alone in the struggle. Jeremy, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? Pretty good. Pretty good. I'm glad we could get this scheduled. We've been chatting a lot online on social media for some time, and I really think that it'll be interesting to get some of your thoughts. And we haven't really had too much pediatrician input on the show in the past too. So I think there's going to be a lot of valuable material that you can add for the audience, for med students in the clinical education sphere. But I do want to start off with the new icebreaker question for this season, which is how are you changing medicine or medical education for the better? I think for me, when you look at medical education, especially in the realm of pediatrics, I think if you're still a med student going through your rotations, you quickly learn how different your pediatric rotation is than some of the other ones. You know, when you're on surgery, when you're in family practice, internal medicine, some of that stuff blends. But pediatrics has its own kind of area that it goes sometimes. And so I think trying to help med students and even residents when they get there, get more comfortable with that, it's important. I think one of the big things we don't talk about a lot in medicine is the fact that we get all this information, we study for tests, we read these books, and we're, we're told this is how you do it, follow this flow diagram, and that's, we learn quickly outside of med school, that's not how life is, and that's pretty prominent, I'd say, in pediatrics as well, you know, there's all these developmental milestones, and what you're supposed to do at two months, and four months, and six months with your babies, and really, in real life, it just doesn't always work out that way, so I think sometimes making sure from the medical training side, it's, yeah, this is the stuff you need to know, but this is the stuff you're going to learn if you decide to go this route too. So, And you probably brought up the bane of my existence in my pediatric studying was that developmental chart and, oh, yeah. that, and the vaccine fun. chart. <laughs> Just. Oh yeah, the vaccine chart always, it's a, it's a good time. You learn it. You, it's repetition, I guess. It is. I mean, I can understand how you would know it if you're doing it every day for a long period of time, but when you're trying to just learn it for the boards for some school exam, it's just rote memorization. It's huge list of very, of yeah, exactly. Bane of my existence. The pediatrics in general is kind of a scary one for some students. You get in there, you've been reading about pediatric patients and the different kinds of things you need to look for in that type of rotation. But when you're actually there and you're working with kids, with infants and toddlers, and also the parents sometimes are kind of scary, then it's just a very different experience than you probably think about beforehand. And I don't know, were you like that when you first got into it or what made you really say, yeah, this is for me? I've always been pretty comfortable with kids, you know, growing up and then through high school and college, I did a lot of camps and camp counseling through either churches or other organizations where I just really enjoyed interacting with kids. And I wasn't taking care of infants during that time. So, you know, the first diaper change is always interesting, but I think with it, it's one of those things that you get comfortable with, like with everything else. And the more you do it, the more you get comfortable with it. It's, it doesn't take too long a time to see how hard it is to hold a baby. And at first you feel like you're going to break it like a vase. And then the next time you're messing with its legs, like it's a chicken wing and you're trying to break it off. So it's, you know, it's one of those things that you get comfortable with the more you mess with it. So I remember before med school, I was a phlebotomist for almost two years, and that was the scariest part was going into the, you know, like the neonatal units and having to draw blood on these fresh babies just came out. They don't have veins yet. <laughs> I can imagine that there are just so many more terrifying procedures that have to be done to the pediatric population. Do you have one in particular that maybe you saw during residency or something that really stands out to you? I mean, from a procedural standpoint, I think that was one of the things that actually drew me to pediatrics too, is there's so many different things that you see in pediatrics from a procedure side that you don't see anywhere else in medicine. I mean, when you talk about, like you said, with the new babies, the neonates, the NICUs, putting it in an umbilical line, or you know, you're trying to get an IV in a kid and you can't get it in the hand, okay, you're going to put it in their head and you're going to do it there instead. You know, it's, that, you're not doing that a lot of other places. I think one of my other ones that I really that stood out to me a lot that I enjoyed was I did a pediatric ophthalmology rotation and 
seeing kids get the muscles of their eyes cut back and resized to get their eyes to line up better. That's, you know, that's something you don't talk about a lot in medicine unless you have a reason to. And so when you get to go in and actually see that procedure, it's pretty cool. Jeez. Yeah. That sounds a little intense. That's yeah. not one I came across in my, in my rotations <laughs> for sure. And you work in, is it the community pediatrics? So he, I'm in Omaha. And so we have a children's hospital system here. And so I work in one of the outpatient clinics there and doing general pediatrics. How does that compare to, let's say, someone that's doing their rotations in their university hospital or something like that? It's quite a different environment, I imagine. When you get into the clinic compared to being in the hospital, it's a totally different world with what you're dealing with and what you're handling. I think one of the things that I struggled with early on in, in my medical school rotations is you have so many hospital rotations. You get so comfortable with, oh, I'm going to order this lab or I'm going to do this test or I'm going to do this imaging and it's going to you know, give me information. In the outpatient world, you really don't have that. You know, I mean, you can, you can do it, but you're not supposed to rely on it. I mean, really most of your time is history and physical, history and physical. I mean, that's really the prime skills that you have there. And you try to minimize the amount of labs and imaging, all that stuff you do. And so when you're not used to that and you first get out into that world, it's not uncommon to have a med student come in for a rotation and be like, oh, this kid's sick. What do you want to do? And they're like, oh, let's get a CBC. And it's like, eh, no, we can't do that. It seems like there probably are some certain personality traits or something that would make someone more prone to go to pediatrics. I know a lot of students I went to school with said they wanted to do pediatrics until their pediatric rotations. <laughs> then they kind of decided not to. And that's just a couple week rotation. That's not even seeing the bulk of the experience. Even a lot of my family members said, you're great with kids. You should go into pediatrics. Like, no, no, that <laughs> doesn't sound right for me. Do you think there are certain traits or maybe it is more the experiences? Like you had so many experiences as a counselor and everything growing up that really put someone into that sort of specialty? I think that's a really great question. I think you can look at pediatrics and assume like, oh, everybody's in their bubbly. They can all make animal puppets and this and that and blah, blah, blah. But really, I mean, just in my training with residency and even working where I work, it's such a wide range of personality types that are doing it. You kind of touched on this earlier, the parents are sometimes the hardest part. I think one of the reasons I went into pediatrics is because I had a hard time with adult patients because they wouldn't follow what you did and do what you did and listen to what you did. You know, with kids, it's not their fault if their diet stinks because the parents are the ones giving them that diet. And so it's easier to I think to empathize sometimes with the kids and then just learning how to manage and not so much manage, that's probably the wrong word, but work with the parents in terms of trying to do more of the right stuff at home compared to the stuff that they probably shouldn't be doing. So that's a big thing. I think that's being able to, you're almost playing the middleman between the kids and the parents sometimes in some aspects. And so it's, I think being comfortable with that and knowing that that's part of it is a big thing. Did you know you can find and schedule your own clinical rotations? Students can reach out to preceptors nationwide and schedule their own rotations. You can even refer a friend, earning you credit towards clinical externships of your choosing. Go to findarotation.com for more information. That's Find a Rotation, your medical and healthcare clinical rotations platform. Is there anything in particular that you find is the hardest aspect of the specialty in general? I think anytime you have a kid who's really sick and you have to deal with the morbidity of that or the mortality. I mean, I, I remember every patient I've ever taken care of from med school all the way up through now who died. The ones that stick with you the most, I think, are kids. Where I practiced and where I trained, we, we did a lot of heart procedures. I love hearts. I love cardiology. Pediatric cardiology is one of my favorite things to learn about was always first to, to volunteer when I was on the rotation to take care of the really sick ones. But that usually meant that that month that I was training, one of them wasn't going to make. And that's, I mean, that's terrible to think that way. But when you're taking care of really sick kids, that's what's going to happen. But it's not easy to deal with. It's not easy to manage. But I think that's the hardest part, honestly. Yeah, I guess you just kind of have to put the positive spin on it. How many are surviving because of this environment instead? So some Things have been changing. Well, everything's been changing in medicine since COVID started, and we're getting a lot more of like the telemedicine, clinical experiences for students, and just complete change in clinical medicine, really. Have you seen this happening a lot in pediatric offices? And if so, like, what could a student maybe expect in this type of environment? 
Yeah, we're definitely utilizing telemedicine a lot more in different aspects. And I think when you look across the country right now in pediatrics, everybody's doing something a little bit different. You have some areas that are only utilizing it for some acute care visits. So like talking about some sick symptoms and deciding if they need to be seen or not, those kind of things. And then you have other places that are doing wellness checks. So they're doing their healthcare visits via Zoom or via whatever in terms of telehealth to do these visits with the caveat that you're going to bring them in a few months later to do the physical exam. And so everybody's kind of doing it a little bit different. So what we've been doing, we've been doing a lot of more visits like that for kind of low-key sick visits like rashes and those kind of things, but then also for kids who are on long-term medications, ADHD, anxiety, depression, that kind of stuff. And so I think that's pretty helpful because those kids a lot of times don't need to be in the office. And so I think that's kind of opened the eyes up from a lot of providers in terms of using telehealth and the benefits of it because those visits, the parents like them, the kids like them. They don't have to get out of their house, out of their beds. They can hop in the car from school and just sit in the car with mom or dad and go through the visit real quick and get back. Well, they might not like getting back into school, but the parents do. So I definitely see some swings there. And I definitely think once everything starts to calm down from the pandemic side of things, people are still going to be utilizing it going forward. Yeah, it's a shame that it took such a devastating pandemic to make these changes that so many physicians and others have been advocating for so long. And at least now we're getting to see it it, more widespread and see the benefits of it and how much it really can work out when we take those, you know, kind of unnecessary boundaries down. For a student that's maybe preparing for their clinical rotation in pediatrics or maybe thinking about residency, are there any particular maybe resources or activities or something that they could do ahead of time to better prepare? I think first understanding kids aren't young adults. They're not little adults. They have different biology. Their bodies work in different ways. Not going to be as simple as going from one rotation to the next sometimes. You got different bugs, different drugs that you're using at these ages than you are in the adult world. So kind of getting comfortable with that, knowing what you're going to probably walk into. You do have to read up on the developmental milestones. You got to be comfortable with those, at least to an extent. I mean, you can't walk in knowing everything with those things. If you have kids, it's really easy to relate your kids to those. So sometimes that helps too. But I think just reading up on that stuff, you know, a lot of programs, I think in med schools, they have little study guides. And so seeing what your other classmates have already learned from it or what they tend to focus on more, I think in their rotations, because some programs, they're going to have a lot more inpatient focus. Some are going to have more, a lot more outpatient focus. And so you got to kind of be comfortable with where you're going to be at for that too. And so the big thing is just understanding that it's not going to be like your other rotations. I think that's the biggest thing. Um, and then really with anything, I think it's just confidence, you know, come in with confidence. Don't be scared to voice your thoughts on something. Even if you don't think it's right, say it. It's better to be confident and wrong than to keep your mouth shut, honestly, on these things. So. It reminds me that there are also a lot of diseases for the boards that you see just for like your pediatric shelves and you never see again. Like, yeah, oh, never. Geez. Even when you're a pediatrician, you never <laughs> yeah, see them exactly. again. Exactly. <laughs> the most rare diseases ever. Do they, those really need to be out there. All right. So I wanted to mention a little bit too about your blog, your website, the imperfect, well, not the imperfectdadmd.com. And this is where you kind of bring together your parenting and your medical information. And we probably have at least some members of the audience that are going through med school and are also parents. So maybe you could explain a little more about what you do with your resources there. Yeah. So, you know, I started that blog kind of early on when everything with the SARS-CoV-2 virus hit. One of those kind of thought processes of how can I contribute more than I already am? Because when everybody was stuck at home and you couldn't have really any patients in the office, there's not a lot you can do to contribute to society at that point. So, you know, I was sitting there trying to figure out what to do with it. And while I'm taking care of my kids and thinking about them, you know, you get these parents that come in and they're struggling, they're having a hard time. And you're there, you're giving them, you know, all the answers, you're smiling, you're helping them guide them through it. And a lot of times you get this sense that they think you're this perfect person and your kids must be amazing and you must be doing a great job. And it's just, even when you know everything, it doesn't always work out that way. And so, and not to say that I know everything, obviously, but I think when it's Sometimes people get this thought process that as a pediatrician, you're doing everything perfect with your kids and it's just not the case. And so I think being able to relate that, being able to take what I know from my job and being able to look at how things go at my household, how I handle my kids, and then being able to relate where I did a good job and where I didn't do a very good job and being able to admit that first and admit the fact that none of us are perfect. 
I think that's helpful. Sometimes people just need to hear that. People just need to realize I don't have to be perfect in everything. Um, and I think with some parents, when they are able to accept that, it takes a ton of stress off their shoulders. It's just, you can kind of see the stress melt away off their face sometimes. And so it's, I was trying to utilize that and hope that it helps people. So. I'm sure it does. Anytime we can go over our mistakes, it gives them that learning aspect, that experience that they might not have to live through themselves and still be able to get the useful information from that. So I like that a lot. For the audience, do you have any parting thoughts for the students? You know, it is interesting how when you look at pediatrics, it's not a scary subspecialty, but in medicine, for some reason, it becomes kind of scary and even scarier than surgery rotations for some reason, because I was terrified to go on my surgery rotations. Although I love surgery, but I just kept my mouth shut on those ones for some reason. But, you know, I think it's go into it with an open mind. Even if you've never considered pediatrics, look at it as a completely different world to learn about and a completely different type of medicine to compared to everything else you've learned. And, you know, when you look at adult medicine, there's so many cofactors into lifestyle and exercise. And, and not to say that it's not with kids, but smoking, drinking, all this stuff, how has it affected their health? You know, when you look at kids, it's a blank slate. You know, you have the opportunity to help these people through early on in their lives to get them to be healthier adults. And so I think that's just such a cool thing to be able to do that and to be able to guide them there. So I think pediatrics isn't the, always the attractive specialty when it comes to that stuff, but it's really, it's such a cool thing to be a part of. Well, is there anywhere else that we can point the audience to find them and get more useful information from you? If you want to learn more about my blog, I'm like you said, at imperfect.md.com. That's where most of that is at right now. Otherwise, you know, check out your local pediatrician, see if they can answer questions for you, get you involved. We're always looking to help people. You know, I think that's the one thing with pediatrics we always want to teach. And so you'll find somebody to do that for you if you want to. Well, it looks like you're definitely teaching a lot of students and parents and well, everyone else at this point. So we really appreciate the material that you have out there. And I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Thanks for asking me. The Rounds to Residency podcast is powered by Med School Coach. To access Med School Coach services, like USMLE tutoring or residency admissions advising, visit our website at medschoolcoach.com. Good luck as you prepare for your board exams, and we hope you tune in again next time.